So I was just speaking at the American Meteorological Society meetings in Seattle, like 5,000 meteorological scientists, weather broadcasters, um, communicators were there. I was part of a new contingent of communication scholars brought in to interface with the meteorologists, and I did an experiment in my presentation where I basically showed some provocative images and very bold assertions, what I would call hypotheses and then just sort of put it out there to see what would happen. So, um, so this is one of the slides that I used um, that I put up almost right away. And you can imagine the context was really a bit surreal because this was a very scientific um, context. So what I wanted to say, climate change concerns who we are, how we live, and what is taken for granted. In climate change, we see a you know, threat to both sense of self and community. So this seems like a bold hypothesis, and it seems probably quite taken for granted. But what I want to suggest here is that if we really take this on board, what I think is intuitive to all of us, if we really take this on board, then it suggests how profound and how deep, and I would use the word ontological, these issues are, which means that sustainability, climate change, these aren't just obviously topics that affect our lifestyle. These actually affect our very sense of who we are, how we live, what it means to be human, um, and our basic sense of survival <coughs> and security. So when we talk about energy, we're talking about human security. We're talking about safety. We're talking about really on that core level. So, um, and, the, and by the way, the image is from an arts project called Cape Farewell from the UK where they sent artists and scientists out to the Arctic and so some of the images I'm using in the slides are taken from that from that project. So this is uh, an image from the very well-known Yale study of the six Americas um, produced by Tony Leserwitz and his colleagues at the um, there's I don't know if you're aware, there's various centers around the country that are really focusing on this issue of climate change and communication. So this is something that you may have seen before. Um, so basically, they, they did a massive um, you know, survey and interview project where this is a scheme that they came up with in terms of trying to help those who are working in communications understand their audience more. So you can imagine it's a very powerful heuristic. It's, a very, it's very compelling. People really love this. I mean, I come, it came up at the AMS meetings all the time. It comes up a lot. So this is kind of where we're at in terms of both a mapping of engagement with these issues, and I am speaking primarily about climate change today, although that's not the only area I'm interested in. Um, but it's also a, a, this is also a map of our thinking about this. And so if I could do a fancy animation, I would actually mix this up. So imagine the dots moving around kind of in almost like, you know, a cool 60s psychedelic, you know, they're not jumping around, but imagine movement here. Imagine it to be dynamic. So this is how I would like to introduce the way that we think about this, which is that we simply are not, we're not fixed. Our levels of engagement are not static that they're socially and context specific. They're informed by how we relate, by our practices, by our identities, which are mutable and dynamic and socially situated. So it's a disappointment in the sense that if you're here to have a plug and play, which someone did say to me at a meeting at, in the, at the city, um, you know, I want to plug and play, which I completely am on board with and would love to help innovate. But it's going to be, um, I think we really want to see the results and the traction we're going for. We might need to think about re, you know, reframing how we look at these issues and the tools we're using. So I'm not denying that there's some, that there's a validity here, that there's a value here, but I'm suggesting that this is just one piece, this is one dimension that might be a nice guide for, for work. Um, So this is sort of, you know, I was thinking about an image of the problem. So the myth of apathy, you know, I like to really highlight the fact that we're all on some level for working in the environmental sector, we're really confronting this fundamental issue. Why don't people do more? 
you know, the public is apathetic, people don't care, they want their SUVs, they want to go to the malls, people, you know, it's just this prevailing <coughs> mantra that is incredibly depressing and dispiriting and disempowering for those working in this area, okay? So, again, this is, has to do with the reframing, but I want to acknowledge that there is a reality, you know, that there is, this is something that you can actually go and see and feel quite viscerally, you know, if you just step outside, you know, and you go to a mall or whatever, you know, that this is, this is the outward appearance, is this problem of inertia, lack of engagement. People don't want to know, they don't want to engage. So current frameworks, I just, this is very, very basic, but, you know, just kind of an overview that there's a lot of research right now in environmental psychology, behavioral, cognitive work. And um, so just to kind of set up, you know, the current landscape, much of the research that you're going to come across right now that's looking at communication, psychology, of climate change is based, it's coming out of risk communication, it's coming out of risk psychology, social psychology research. Okay, so we're talking about people like Elka Weber, we're talking about Paul Slovic at U of O, um, that, you know, it goes back to the early 80s actually, the first paper written about the psychology of climate change was in the early 80s by someone named Baruch Bischoff. Um, so that's the legacy, that's the history, that's the epistemology that's informing the studies that are currently most circulated at the moment. And I'm not at all dismissing them. I'm just laying out the, the, the ground here, where we're, where we're at. So cognitive information processing. So that has to do with, you know, the ability for us to respond to threats, whether they're immediate or, you know, the kind of proximity debate that you hear about, that climate change is too... It's too abstract, it's too far away. We need to find a way to make these things more immediate, more relevant for our personal lives. The barriers and obstacle discourse is um, it's a framework that's commonly used which, frame, which poses the problem, what are the barriers to engagement? Okay, um, that, this, is, this is how, I mean, I just wanna kinda highlight that this is a particular construction, you know, that there are barriers. Okay, but this is, this is basically very um, prevalent in the psychological research, uh, especially in climate change and psychology, barriers and obstacles. That could be a barrier, could be uh, inefficacy. So basically, uh, people feeling powerless, people feeling that they can't make a difference, um, undermining their own sense of efficacy in their lives, not knowing what to do, not having the structures of action, like very pragmatically, not having the vehicle to engage. These are all framed as barriers to, or obstacles to engage. Um, concern is a deficit. So again, there's this idea, why don't people care more? We need to get people more engaged. We need to get people to care. Uh, a relation of info and action. Now thankfully, this is on the way, it's being moved out. But there has been a dominant paradigm that, that we all know about, which is that people need more information. And there's actually some fascinating debates right now, actively, around how dire, how urgent should our messaging be. So there was a study that came out recently by UC Berkeley where they said that basically the, the main takeaway was that if it's too dire and too depressing, people will turn off and not engage. And then there was a nice rebuttal from a researcher, Bob Bruhl, a sociologist, who basically says, come on, they had a small sample, it was undergraduates at UC Berkeley, and, you know, he basically kind of deconstructed the study, but it generated this fascinating debate. So this is very live right now, which is this issue of how much information do we relay, how much is enough to motivate and stimulate without going over the tipping point to overwhelm and despair and powerlessness. So this is sort of where we're at right now as people are trying to feel this out, but thankfully, there is more of a recognition that information isn't just enough. It's not just about getting people the information, that we have to think about this very differently. Uh, this is the, in a way, I think this is the most important point and really gets to the heart coming from, which is this idea of a rational subject. This is so ubiquitous in our ways of thinking that I don't think just being here in this discussion is gonna necessarily, I mean, we're talking about very deeply entrenched um, epistemology based on the fact that we make rational decisions 
no offense to the philosopher in the room. I, mean, I know it's very complicated, but I'm just saying that basically the, 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 the um, conception of subjectivity that we, we find engaged in behavioral cognitive studies tend to sort of, sort of I, my sense is that they assume that we are unitary, meaning that, that it's fixed somehow, that we're not changing, you know, that these things are not changeable or mutable, which they, which they arguably are. Um, but also that there's a rational kind of, that, that we do what we value. So there's this whole notion of the behavior attitude gap. So my, uh, my view would say, you know, the idea of a gap is completely absurd. It's not that there's a gap or a void or an absence of something. It's that there's actually some really complicated things going on in there, in between. And to say that there's a gap between values and attitudes and behavior and action, it presumes a causal relationship that we all do what we value and we all act on our, you know, what we know to be right and true. And we all know that's not necessarily true. So I would really, you know, suggest rethinking this, this equation of, of assuming that you know what people say in the polls and the surveys, we care about the environment, but yet Americans aren't doing anything about it. Well, I would suggest there's some very complex reasons why that is, and it has nothing to do with the level of care or concern. Okay. <laughs> okay. Psychosocial framework. I've suggested. Um, so this is really where I'm coming from. I don't want to spend a heavy amount. You're not here to learn about psychosocial studies, but um, this will help help you understand more about where I'm coming from here is the role of affect. So affect is thank thankfully starting to enter the discourse now. Um, people, there's researchers, Lauren Zoni, there's Lorraine Whitmarsh. I studied in the UK, so I'm more familiar with the UK researchers. Um, they they conceptualize engagement as a integration as a com you know basically three part affect behavior and cognition. So I'm really happy and excited to see affect is there. Although the what affect means to them might be different to what affect means to a psychosocial researcher or to a psychotherapist, which is where I draw a lot of my inspiration is is in the very rich world of psychotherapy. There's like a lot of people out there who are working on the front lines with human beings in clinical context who know a heck of a lot about affect, they know about resistance, they know about denial, they know about projection, and I'm trying to bring some of that into how we're thinking about these things. So affect in this context refers to the visceral kind of gut experiential level. It's energetic. It's that it's it's not even necessarily conscious. It doesn't necessarily get to the thought cognition level, although it can. And I'm not suggesting affect is sort of out there floating around and without a social context. Affect is also social, as I would say these other things are. It's, it's not sort of just something locked away inside of us. Yet, I would say affect is actually potentially one of the most important pieces of all of this. And it's also the most difficult to study and to research, which is why I think there's a lack of research and empirical research in this area, which is what we desperately need. So if anyone here is interested in funding research around this, I think this is a rich, rich area and in, it requires different methods and I I'm, I'm, have no claim to being proficient in studying affect. It's very much on the edge where researchers are trying to find ways of getting at affect um, and affect often means unconscious dimensions. Subjectivity is multiple and fluid. This is coming out of kind of more post-structural um, idea of subjectivity as something that's not fixed, rational, unitary. If, if we want, we can talk more about that later if that's not clear. That we're not self-evident, so when you ask people in an interview or a survey or a poll or a focus group is not necessarily the, what, is, what is authentic or true for them. And it doesn't mean that people are lying. It means that none of us are immediately wholly accessible to ourselves. Okay, so that's a really important piece in terms of the methodologies that we use. Um, standing, how we engage with these issues, unconscious responses, um, um, you know, you could say are what inform defense mechanisms. So what, when we think about denial and projection, I've gotten, there was a piece that was in the New York Times.Earth about 
about this idea of the myth of apathy and psychoanalysis and people really went after me because they thought I was, you know, the, and actually they were the climate skeptics and deniers who felt very upset and hostile and angry that I was basically suggesting that they were in denial. And I mean, it was just, it, it was a mess. But I'm not... Perfect example. It's, yeah, so it was sort of some people felt, okay, that vindicates the whole point, but that's not my interest in, in calling, you know, pathologizing people. What I'm trying to say is that there's very good reasons why we engage in strategies that we all recognize as, de as denial or projection or splitting where we're kind of simultaneously aware of two different things or more than one thing at the same time. I'm flying the Arctic global warming, I have to fly. I mean, this is just part of human experience and a lot of this is on the unconscious level. Denial is socially produced, and this is really a, a mm. reference to Kari Norgard's work. So Kari Norgard is at Whitman, but she's actually moving soon to, um, I think, U of O. And she, her book coming out soon is called Living in Denial. It's based on ethnography she did. She's a sociologist, I'm not but she's interested in how denial is socially produced, and she did her study in Norway, and she, it was a really sensitive, insightful study. Um, and actually, she was here, so some of you may have seen her speak. Um, we had her come out for the, for the Public Humanities Center. Anxiety, so this is the point about defenses. Anxiety leads to defenses. This is, for me personally, the, the core of what I'm trying to suggest is that these issues make us deeply anxious. I think it's, I always feel weird saying that because it seems so obvious. But anxiety leads to defenses. Anxiety is something that I think psychotherapists, uh, people working in clinical contexts, know a lot about, okay? So this is, I think, really, really important. So I thought it might be nice to give you a quick detour into my research study because I find that people tend to want some sort of example of what I'm talking about. This is a study, it's not a case study in the sense of a campaign, which I think is what you all probably really want, and I don't quite have that. But I have a research study where I went in um, to the Great Lakes, I was funded by a communications <coughs> firm, so I was told I had to engage with the Great Lakes in some way. That was the only remit. So I went to the Green Bay, which was ecologically troubled. There was a small group of environments. So basically, this was a place where I could study this idea about apathy and lack of engagement, because there was a small group of very committed, uh, passionate environmental scientists, advocates, educators, and they felt very, it's a, the leader is the word I would use, just why, you know, trying to get people in this community to do more to repair and restore and respond to both climate-related issues, um, the water, the air, and so forth. Um, I used a survey, so I partnered with a market research firm that generously let me have access to their database, and I, um, I administered an online survey to their whole database in Green Bay. It was a, a, about 3,000 people, and I had a, um, quite a high return rate on the responses. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it was 18% or something like that. And, um, and then within that, I, I designed the survey, and this is something I'm interested in working with organizations on, is I designed the survey as best I could, given what everything I've just been talking about, to try to capture some less straightforward information. And, and one, of, one tool or one way I try to do that is to have people you know, reflect on how often do they think about these issues, do they talk about them, what do they read, and so forth. But really, for me, the key was how, you know, how, do, how often do they think about environmental issues? And I provided a spectrum of, you know, never to frequently. And I ruled, you know, immediately ruled out the frequently and the people who read environmental literature. And I went for people who seemed to have some level of awareness and literacy so they could at least fill out small, you know, short answers, but would appear to, for an environmental perspective to be apathetic or not engaged. And I used a psychosocial methodology, which involved doing in-depth interviews, three per person. So the important thing is that I didn't just do one, I did three. 
And a lot changes and happens across three. I could have done seven. You know, if I had people working for me, I could have done a number of interviews. Um, some researchers in the UK do seven to ten. Um, I organize the interviews in a very open, free associative way. I use prompts. I mean, it, I, I don't want to go into it too much. So basically, I, I designed them as best I could to set up a context where people could speak very openly and not in a very directed way. So I never asked directly questions, what do you think or how do you feel about the environment, ever. I mean, that in, in this perspective, that would be counterproductive because then you just get, you get the kind of, response, the kind of quick hit, but we would get to all of that by going through the side. So it's sort of like, a, I think of it as a lateral or a side approach. Tell me about where you grew up. That was my opening question. They knew I was interested in the environment because they had to do an ethics consent, so they knew that. Um, and that was just enough for them to immediately start providing these narratives and rich memories and you know really compelling information. By the end, um, we did get down to this. So this is an ad that had been circulating in the Great Lakes um, by a coalition called Healing Our Waters or um, HealthyLakes.org. And so I had seen the focus group footage for generating this ad. I had my own feelings and thoughts about how those were handled and conducted. I was interested in just bringing this in. At the end of the three interviews, the last thing we did I would present them this image and I would just ask them to what, what comes up for you, not what do you think, not would you go to the website, which is what the focus groups of course want to know, would you go. So yeah, I'm interested would they go, but really I'm going to say what comes up for you. And then immediately I would, I would say 10 out of 10, they would use this as a prompt to start telling me how they conceptualize their environmental identity. You know, I'm not an environmentalist, I would never join a group, um, you know, I feel really scared. Uh, you know, they basically, without my having to even ask, they would do it. So, this is again just a super basic summary. What I found in my huge amount of data, as you can imagine, 10, 30, I did sort of a narrative analysis. I didn't use software, I didn't code. I basically looked at the themes, the characters, the plot lines, the affect. Uh, environmental objects, so the boats, the, the beach, you know, whatever they talked about from the environment that seemed relevant. Um, but, the, but really what I want to say is that I, I found strong narratives of concern and care. Remember this is a group that really did appear to be not caring too much. A lack of action or practices, so these people were not engaged at all in any environmental activity. Um, that doesn't mean they didn't do personal intimate activities such as being you know, recycling or buying organic food, um, but I mean civically uh, engaged. Ambivalence regarding action and involvement. So yeah, it's not, you know, it's with a whole variety of reasons why they would not get involved. Um, pride and honor of place. This is culturally specific to Wisconsin and Green Bay and this culture, so I'm not, this isn't generalizable necessarily, but there's a great pride and honor of the place and of the industry, that's the paper mill in the background that's completely messed up the river. You may know this is a PCB, this is a, a super fun site. Um, but yet they recognize Green Bay as a wonderful place to live. Sadness and despair, um, you know, sense of the fact that it's basically been, you know, kind of ruined. Um, the, the beach, the Green, Green Bay is a beach, the Fox River. Um, Self-opting out of action, so this sort of relates to the, the third point, which is, you know, I wouldn't do that, environmentalists are, are obsessive and, man, you know, maniacal or whatever. Um, contradicting desires and fears. Note that I did not engage in any sort of partisan, you know, I didn't even introduce that into this frame because personally it's not that interesting to me. Um, but, so I didn't, in case you're wondering about the whole partisan issue, that didn't really enter in here. Um, contradicting desires and fears. So this is really, again, a real key point is that we do have contradiction with regard to industrial environmental problems. We enjoy our, the fruits of industry. We enjoy our technology. We also feel concerned. I mean, I'm not, I, I know it sounds like I'm making rash generalizations. I'm just simply trying to acknowledge that we have contradictions. Uh, you mean contradictory or they contradicting somebody else? Con internally contradictory, that that's just part of living in an industrialized context is that 
you know, it's not all smooth. It's not all of a piece. So uh, what's the takeaway? I hope no one's offended by this New Yorker cartoon. Someone told me they thought it was too Christian, but anyway, so what's the takeaway? And this is, um, this is, um, I think it's, I mean, I'm, I'm totally a pract, I'm, I'm an applied researcher. To me, there has to be a takeaway, but I am actually looking for context in which to start applying some of this work. So. There's only so much I can say in terms of here's a best practice, but I certainly have a lot of ideas about what that might look like, but I don't actually know until, until I do it. Um, the takeaway is that it's not so straightforward, that research shows much of our behavior from you know, all these various things that we'd like to get people to stop doing are, um, are practiced, mediated by, I don't know what I meant, but that they're mediated by our meanings. So in other words, what a car, I mean, I feel like we all know this on some level, but you know, what the automobile of the car might mean, it might have absolutely no, you know, it might have to do with our father growing up and, you know, a deep attachment, not wanting to get rid of the car. I mean, that these things are very um, complex and that often what we do is informed and mediated by the meanings that we ascribe to what we do. Um, narrative has to do with how we make sense of ourselves in the world and with each other. So this also constructs, you know, it, it constitutes our practices. So I'm trying to help us shift our way of thinking from the values and attitude model to really thinking about this in terms of meaning, narrative, um, identity, and feeling and affect. And you, as you can see, I know this is really, this complicated. I'm not, you know, I'm just trying to give you really a, a broad stroke here um, that, and we can talk more about this in our time. Um, effective communications, people want to know from me what would I suggest. Well, I do have a cohort of psychoanalytic and psychological um, psychotherapeutic colleagues and so um, this is something that's actively being kind of investigated right now and and really, if, we, if I can try to translate some of that into practice, this is, this is like a few steps away from the actual plug and play, tell me what to do. Okay, so this is more kind of still on the abstract level a little bit, but allow for coexistence of conflicting desires. So in our communications, in our messaging, is there a way, or our engagement practice, is there a way to allow for coexisting conflicts and aspirations? Okay, is there a way to acknowledge that these things are complicated, that maybe you don't want to get rid of or change the way that you're doing things, but you also want the world to, you know, you want a cleaner environment. So there's some way of acknowledging that because this, the hypothesis is if you don't, what's going to happen is a real defensiveness. There's going to be this immediate, like, something comes up almost like, you know, something quite rigid. If people feel threatened, if people feel like they're being moralized and cajoled and pressured, something does happen that actually makes our work so much harder. It's a, it's a rigidity, it's a something brittle. And so what I'm trying to think through is how can we soften? How can we actually support what is there? So this again is not a deficit model, it's really wanting to support what is already there that needs to be channeled and supported. Okay, so I don't know what it, this would look like if you're trying to run a campaign for carbon reduction in Lake Oswego, or you know, I don't know. I would want to work with some other people about that and community. You know, people who are skilled in PR and marketing and communications. You know, I, I would want to explore that. Um, address potential anxieties at the get-go. This is my fantasy. Is like some an ad or some campaign that basically says, yes, we know that this is scary. We know that this probably makes you feel anxious. I don't mean literally, but somehow suggests that. And we are working on this, so this is what we can do. So if you address potential anxieties, I have a feeling that we might find less defensiveness and more willingness to engage. <clears throat> Anticipate potential fear and loss. So 
This refers to work, um, <clears throat> there's a woman, Rosemary Randall, in the UK who founded an organization called Car Cambridge Carbon Footprint. She's in Cambridge, UK. And they, part of what they do is they have groups called Carbon Conversations. They run for six meetings. I would really love to try to do something like that, um, get something going like that in the Northwest. But basically, it's a way for people to come together and tell their stories in a very non-threatening way. So she's a psychotherapist. She never talks about emotion. She, I mean, no one would even know she was a psychotherapist. She's like very gorilla about her work. Only I know. I mean, she doesn't want to freak people out. You know, she, and she wants all kinds of people from backgrounds and ethnicities and demographics. She wants people to feel totally safe. This is in the UK, so it's like their logo is a big pot of tea. So people sit around having tea, and she also has a game, which I just got, a, she just sent me, and it's a, it's kind of a board game. So whether people here would sit around drinking tea, playing a board game, I don't know. But the point is that she, um, she, we'll, we'll schedule a session soon. <laughs> so she um, has noticed in her groups, having run these, you know, many, many groups, that there's a lot of loss that people are basically in a process of mourning, um, whether it's an identity, kind of who am I without X, Y, and Z, or literally, you know, my children live in Australia and I don't feel I can continue flying to see them as much, or, or it might even be more the peak oil, like I'm not gonna be able to see them as much. And she has a paper that was published in Eco-Psychology that is just one of the best papers I've seen writing about the role of loss and mourning and how people come to terms with climate and how what the implications are for the work that we're doing in advocacy and communications. Uh, Randall, Rosemary Randall. And uh, finally, focus on solutions strategies in the context of above. So this is sort of, you know, I know that the solutions paradigm is, is king right now and, you know, that, that we all want solutions. But we need to really be careful about manically, and manic is a term out of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. Manic suggests a quality of behavior that's compulsive. That's, that's manic, you know, it's like, I gotta do this. It's, there's a certain compulsive quality about it. So I think we have to be very cautious about being manic about solutions because we're so scared of acknowledging all the other stuff. So by being manic about solutions, we're colluding with the broader social cultural denial and not will you know inability to really confront what's happening. So I would suggest solutions and strategies are absolutely key, but they need you know I would suggest that they may be more effective if they're framed in a slightly different context. Now, I totally acknowledge that different things are going to work for different people and that some people are very solutions oriented and I'm not denying that at all. So I know I'm, I'm painting a broad brush. I'm not suggesting everyone, you know, needs all of this. It's obviously, you know, we need, it needs audience analysis, but this is sort of my, my hit, quick hit. Um, layered messaging, um, again, this is, this is me just fantasizing here. This is me not having practiced this in a pilot, in a pilot campaign with Metro, for example, which I would, you know, love to do. Um, but, you know, this is, this is this idea that in our messaging, it doesn't have to be simplistic, that basically we can, you know, um, tap into doing the right thing, because we research supports that that is, that does have an efficacy, okay? That the moral piece, the guilt piece, shouldn't just be thrown out, but we need to handle it very, very carefully. Um, for the reasons of not wanting to stimulate defenses. Desire for convenience and ease. Um, I mean, I'm just throwing out, these are just sort of some things that I'm suggesting are, are levers, but can be engaged in a layered, kind of complex sort of way. So, um, addressing the desire that we don't, I'm talking about recycling here, not thinking about waste. So what happens that, you know, when we talk about recycling, we're talking about waste management, we're talking about garbage, we're talking about trash, we're talking about dirt, impurity, pollution, contamination. That, that these topics that we're talking about, if you trace 
the associations they may have, they won't have for everyone, but they may have, we may be able to understand on a deeper level what might make people less willing to engage. Um, desire to be part of a solution, so really tapping into that fact that, that people do want to be part of something larger, and for this not to even be an issue, so feeling potentially resent resentful, like, oh, I'm so sick of hearing about the environment, you know, I just, why didn't they just, like, do something about it, or why is this even happening? So these are sort of the, the moral, the ease, these are sort of affective levers that I'm just throwing out there. And finally, um, the surplus of affect. So this is really, you know, if we, that, we, that there is a surplus, there's not a deficit. But we just need to be more creative and more strategic about finding that and, and supporting that. I really take this out of psychotherapeutic practice. Um, these folks like Thomas Doherty here in Portland, they know, he's an eco-psychologist here, they, they work with people. They understand that there is usually some sort of desire there, some energy there, some affect there, and it, it's about really supporting that, having it feel having a safety there for that to come out. So if we take that on board, soothe the superego, this is the idea that we tend to re defend against the superego, we rebel. We were, you know, if there's any hint of moralizing, we say, well, F you. So, you know, if we can try to find a way of removing the moralizing, um, that would stimulate the superego. Focusing on pleasure, innovation, creativity, there's an artist who I brought, the Center for Public Humanities brought out twice now, Natalie Jeremy Jenko, who, she's at NYU, and her work really, really, like, opens us up wide open that people, you know, need pleasure and playfulness and desire and make this fun, make this, you know, it's provocative because, you know, it's like, where, when are you going too far and making this too fun and too much of kind of a art project or, whatever, but I think she's absolutely on to something. She calls her work, um, it's about addressing the crisis of agency, and so she creates context to, to really involve people in a very creative way. Um, so inviting participation and feedback, again, this is part of, you know, what happens when we're part of something creative, when we're part of something larger. And um, creating participatory opportunities, so again, this is creating context for people to plug in, and I don't just mean having a website where people send in their favorite photos, which I think is fine, but I'm talking about on a much deeper level and ideally in a way that brings people into contact with one another. So that's really on the civic level. If I, if I could suggest, you know, for the Eco District Project, for example, you know, there's no, as far as I know, there's not a lot of acknowledgement of the role of arts, creativity, engagement, how to get people out and actually working on something together in a fun, creative way. Um, so that's where I'm at. So I did talk a lot longer than I thought, but I, I enjoyed having the space to. And um, so now we have an hour, right, to do to, to, uh, Thank you. Thank you.